Our speaker today is Lynn Garthwaite, and she's a longtime resident of Bloomington and been involved in the Bloomington schools. She probably will get into her history a little bit herself, but um, when her name came across uh, with her topic as program chairman, I thought, you know, this is something that we'd all be interested in. We've all driven around the U.S. Um, we know the shapes, the sizes, and the politics, and how come one state's bigger than the other. And I thought it would just be a fascinating topic. So really, without further ado, I'm going to let her start, uh, Lynn Garthwaite. Thank you. Um, I did start this um, uh, in an odd way. My husband is from Wisconsin, and we were just having a conversation. This would have been about four years ago. And he said he has always wondered why, um, I forgot about the mic, why Wisconsin doesn't have the Upper Peninsula. Why is that part of Michigan and not Wisconsin? And I thought, well, you know, I don't know the answer to that either. I'm going to look it up. So I found a book online, found it on Amazon called how our states got their shapes, perfect, perfect solution. And it gave me the answer, and I'll, I'll share it with you in a minute, just a tease, it's all the fault of Toledo, Ohio. Um, but I kept reading through this book, which was um, covered all 50 states. It was very much a textbook. And I was a history major at Carleton College, fellow alum of Don and Leslie Stiles. Um, but I still had trouble navigating this book. It was just like so convoluted and all these references to obscure land grants, who cares? Every border war in the East Coast had a name, you know, the Cresaps War and the Dog and Pony War or whatever. So I thought somebody needs to rewrite this book because the material was fascinating. I kept having these head slapping moments like, you know, oh my God, I had no idea, you know, this is so cool. And I thought somebody needs to rewrite this book in like layman's terms so that like even fifth graders can get it into it and, and adults who are curious about these things. And I'd written six children's books by that time. So I thought, oh, I guess I'm going to do it. So that's how it started. So three years of research and writing. I used that book as my main source and I credited him heavily in the front of my book. Um, but and I also contacted that author to tell him what I was doing. He said, great, sounds go for it. Um, so I, I got started. So. All 50 states are representing, represented in my book, and oddly enough, they all have interesting stories. Even the, the um, rectangles of Wyoming and Colorado have interesting stories behind them. But I'm going to do kind of a little highlight reel, and I'm going to start in the middle because that's kind of where I started, and that was the Upper Peninsula. So it turns out, like I said, it's all the fault of Toledo, Ohio. So when both um, Michigan and Ohio were territories about to become states, and one of the criteria at that time was you had to have a population of 60,000. You had to have reached that population level. And both Michigan and um, Ohio territories had reached that level, but they were fighting over who got Toledo. And the reason Toledo was important is because it was a port town. And in those days, picture it's horse and buggy days, everything got moved by waterways. And so if you had crops that you harvested in the fall, you know, you'd load them on a barge and bring them to market. Cattle, people, just everything was moved by waterways. And so a port town was really important. So they fought over it. And it was so contentious that something called the, the Toledo War broke open. But uh, there were no casualties because Congress stepped in and said, we've got to mediate this thing. And in the course of mediating, they found in favor of Ohio. So they awarded Toledo to Ohio, which meant that Michigan's southern border was lifted a little bit, raised up. So to compensate them, they gave them the Upper Peninsula. And so if you can imagine at that time, the territorial governor of Wisconsin woke up and said, <laughs> really, really, what? You're giving them what? And the problem was Wisconsin had not yet hit that 60,000 population mark. They were not due to become a state soon, and so they had no vote in the matter. So they were able to wrangle a little bit about exactly where that border was, but they had no vote in the matter. So timing is everything, however, because the next year Wisconsin hit the 60,000 population vote. So had things happen in a different, um, different timing, it might have worked out differently. But so what I found interesting, and I've always thought my entire life that our, our, um, our map looks like a jigsaw puzzle. It looks so random. It looks like there was no planning at all. And what I found out in my research, there was a lot more planning than you might guess. Um, for example, well, the main um, impetus of that was Thomas Jefferson. He had this ideal that all states should be of equal size. Because if you're of equal size, you have equal representation, equal access to natural resources, theoretically, you know, same population size, that kind of thing. It was too late for the East Coast that had already been formed. We already had that. But going forward, by that time, we were pretty bent on expanding all the way to the Mississippi River. 
Um, we didn't have a design at that time of going all the way to the Pacific because the French and the Spanish were all over the West Coast, but we did think we'd get to the Mississippi River. So he drew out a grid. He just kind of just sat down, drew out a grid. He, he gridded out a bunch of states all about the same size between what we already had on the East Coast and the Mississippi River. And he gave them these long uh, Greek names that nobody could ever pronounce. He did name one Jefferson, so he did have enough of an ego to do that. <laughs> And even though we didn't end up using that exact grid, his ideal stuck. And I'm going to kind of highlight a couple things. Um, when we um, divided up the Carolina colony, we got Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi out of it. They're all pretty much the same size. And even North and South Carolina, even though they're not the same, same shape, they are roughly the same in, um, in square miles. Um, the Northwest Territory was one of the first ones we expanded to. They just called it that because it was north and west of the Ohio River. Um, when they divided that up, they got Michigan, um, Wisconsin, Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois. And so they kind of got basically same size, very similar size. Um, as we moved west, look at North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, and Kansas are all exactly three degrees of height. And that's using the, the longitude latitude things. They're exactly three degrees of height. That's not an accident. Um, when they formed the southern border of Kansas, they did it knowing that there is exactly 12 degrees between that southern border and our northern border where we met Canada, and they could divide it into four equal states. So totally planned, much more than you might think. They're also each about seven degrees of width, and there are a bunch of states out here that are seven degrees of, degrees of width. That's also planned. So it looks random at first, but when you kind of start to dig into it, it, it was planned a lot more. And they were so well planned that when they were like, forming states like Nebraska, they were already thinking, you know, Oregon, Washington. They already, by that time, we had bought the Louisiana Purchase, so we knew now we we're going all the way to the west. So they were thinking two, three states ahead. So it, it, was, it was pretty well planned. Jefferson had that ideal. Um, the question uh, comes up a lot, why are the states in the east so um, small and boxy, or uh, squiggly, I should say, and when you get out west, they're big and boxy? And the answer to that turned out to be railroads. Because again, the rivers played an important part. Way back when we were settling in the east, rivers were crucial to movement of anything. Um, and so each state needed access to a river. And, and for many of them, it was to get to the ocean because they were doing transcontinental you know, um, trade. Um, so it made sense to use the rivers as the borders because then one state couldn't prevent another state from getting access to a river. If the, if the river was the border, both sides had equal access. So on the East Coast, they used the rivers and mountain ranges were often the case of the Appalachians to come up with those um, squiggly borders. But by the time we moved West, we had brought railroads in. And that was the transportation way to move all your cattle now and all your, your you know, crops and things like that. So it was no longer that important to use rivers. So that, that's, that's the explanation for why we kind of changed the shapes. It was, it was you know, quite a different uh, theory going on. Um, one of my favorite stories, and I'm just going to kind of hit on a couple of highlight ones, uh, the Missouri boot heel. Um, when, those, when Missouri and Arkansas were both territories, that was just a straight line. You know, they just kind of, a lot of the territorial lines were drawn kind of quick. They had a pretty good idea what they wanted to do, but it was subject to change. When a state became ratified, that's when the lines became permanent. So those were two territories. Um, Missouri was about to become a state, though. It was way ahead of Arkansas. And there was a guy named John Hardiman Walker. In 1818, he got on a horse. He rode from his property in northeast Arkansas. He owned a huge cattle ranch, and he, he rode to D.C. to lobby Congress. He might have been one of the first lobbyists ever. Um, he wanted his property to be part of Missouri, because Missouri now had grown quite a bit economically. St. Louis was already the gateway town. All kinds of commerce was coming through St. Louis. People, everybody moving west was coming through St. Louis. The town was growing. Uh, every boat on the Mississippi stopped in St. Louis. He knew that if his property was part of Missouri, it'd be worth a lot more than Arkansas, because Arkansas just didn't have anything comparable at that time. He apparently was successful because when they ratified Missouri and they drew that line, they drew that little line around, the, around his um, property and, and it became part of Missouri. That's what we know as the Missouri boot heel. By the way, he was 23 years old, so quite the entrepreneur. And he had gotten that property, his parents, he was, lived in a, on a cattle ranch with his family, and um, there were other cattle ranches in the area, but um, in about 1816, the um, 
uh, New Madrid Fault moved, and there was a huge earthquake, and it destroyed pretty much everything. And a lot of people just sort of abandoned their ranches and just left. He stayed behind, and he just sort of at pennies on the dollar swooped up all that land and a lot of the cattle that was left behind. They just abandoned everything. So he became this quite uh, successful entrepreneur. So um, the Minnesota top knot too. I've lived in Minnesota pretty much my entire life and I never knew why we had that. I call it the top knot. It's actually got a real name. It's called the Northwest Angle. And it turns out it was essentially a mistake. So if you think about as we, um, and by the way, there were a lot of surveying errors early on that caused mistakes in borders that some of them to this day are causing issues. There are a couple of Supreme Court things going on, and if we have time, I'll talk about them. Um, as we were moving east, we just kind of um, came up with this border between us and Canada, just kind of piecemeal, bits and pieces. As we moved, you know, we'd, then we'd talk to them again and come up with a border or whatever. By the time we got to here, we had, we had settled, or we had, we had gotten the border to that point, and by then we'd bought the Louisiana Purchase. So now we knew we were moving all west. Canada was doing the same thing. So the two sides got together and said, let's just pick a line and stick with it. Well, let's just grab one. So they picked the 49th parallel, and by picking that parallel, it allowed both Canada and the US equal access to the Great Lakes. Again, vital importance. If they picked like the 50th parallel, that would have been way up here, and Canada would have been cut off. So, 49th parallel, they said, great, sounds good. But both of them made a mistake in the writing of the treaty. Both sides misunderstood how far north the Lake of the Woods went. And in the wording of the treaty, it, it basically said, um, we'll, well, it said, we're gonna go through the chain of lakes to get up, reach the 49th parallel, and then continue further west. But the wording of the treaty said that the Lake of the Woods would fall south of that and be all the United States. And it wasn't until they got up to survey it that they realized they had both been wrong, both sides had been wrong. The Lake of the Woods went quite a bit further north. So rather than rewrite the entire treaty, they just you know, did kind of what they did in Missouri. They just drew the line up and over and then continued far, all the way west. The only exception is right at the end, you don't see it here, but Vancouver Island does, fall, does reach south of the 49th parallel, and that is part of Canada. That was the compromise they reached. They weren't gonna like cut off part of it and usurp that. So, so that was a mistake, lots of mistakes along the way. Um, there are a lot of exceptions to the rule too. I talked about the um, Jefferson's ideal of the equal state. So the obvious couple are California and Texas, and those are interesting stories. So California had um, been a part of what's, Spain had a bunch of territory here, Texas, California. They had Florida for the longest time. Um, when California became an independent republic, they had a choice to make. They, they, much of the West was, even the ones that weren't solidified as states were territories, so it was clearly gonna be all US, except for California, that was an independent republic. They had the choice to either join the United States or stay independent, and, and so they went to our Congress and said, you know, we'd really like to because it was very beneficial for them. When you join a big uh, country like this, you have the benefit of their military, you know, and you can do trade between states without any problems. And then you're also not some lone um, country just kind of sitting surrounded by another country. So it was, it was very much in their benefit. And from the Congress's side, same thing. We don't want a, a lone country sitting on the edge of our, our territory there. And you know, right now they're friends, but down the line, you don't know, they might become enemies. And, uh, and you know, so it behooved us too. So both sides were in agreement, let's do it. But Congress put a stipulation on it. They said, but we're gonna divide you into three or maybe four states because we got this thing here, we got this Jefferson thing that we want all the states to be about the same size. And California said, oh, wait a minute, breaks, breaks. Uh, no, we don't want that. They knew that power came with their size. You know, size was power. Um, they didn't want to divide up. They, they'd been, you know, they'd fought hard for this independence. So they said, no, oh man, I don't think we're gonna do that. And Congress said, yeah, but you know, we got this thing, whatever. Well, they danced back and forth between each other for a year, and a year later, gold was found in the uh, hills of California. California then held all the cards. It was basically, okay, you know, Congress said, okay, whatever, you know, we'll do it. So, and, and you know, many of you know, to this, this day, there is talk about dividing California because the Northern Californians say, we're not anything like South, Southern Californians, and I'm sure it will never happen, but it's, it's interesting to talk about. But, so yes, we took California as they were. And the line, the, the border here does follow the mountain range. You know, they just made it a straight line, but it follows the mountain range 
So Texas was another story, kind of similar. They'd become an independent republic. You probably remember the name Sam Houston. He fought for uh, you know, the revolution. So they gained independence from Mexico. Um, they um, were much larger at that time than they are today. Um, oh, thank you. Um, they, Texas, when, when Texas became independent, their territory actually extended way up into, like a little bit into Wyoming. It was kind of like a big finger that kind of went up in here. Plus they had about half of what we now know as New Mexico. Yeah, oh yeah, there you go, <laughs> middle finger. Um, but their timing turned out to be not so great because the United States had just established something called the Missouri Compromise. Now this was the pre-Civil War way to settle the whole slavery issue. The Missouri Compromise said that anything, any state that was above this borderline right here would not own slaves. Anything <coughs> south of that could be a slave-owning state. Well, Texas really, really, really wanted to be a slave-owning state. So they were willing to knock off all of this territory up here in order to settle on this northern border so they would qualify. Now, it, was, it behooved them well because they were dead broke. Revolutions are very expensive. They needed the money, so by selling off this land to the United States, it, it helped them. And then at the same time, they sold off the chunk that they had as part of what we now know as New Mexico. So that, it worked out for them, too. They were still enormous, but they meet the, met the criteria of being a slave-owning state by settling their border there. But now they that brought up another issue. Um, Kansas' southern border was already established. We put Texas right there, and it left this little orphan strip of land right there that didn't belong to anybody. So Congress said, well, we'll just stick it on the end of Oklahoma and give them a panhandle. So that's how that happened. So, so a lot of these, these odd shapes happen by kind of quirk or happenstance, and that was a good example of one of them. So um, another interesting thing, we used to have a state named Franklin. I didn't know it until I started researching. Did anybody know that? No. Uh, for four years, we actually had a state. It was a legitimate state with a state uh, constitution. They had a governor. They had the, you know, everything all written up. And for four years, they, they um, worked as, a, as an existing state. They were right in the, let's see if I can do it from an angle, this little tip on the end of Tennessee. Um, so it was very small, about the size of Rhode Island, but they were a full-fledged state. But finances kind of finally got them. There weren't a lot of resources there. Um, they just couldn't keep things going, and so they got absorbed into Tennessee at, at eventually after four years. But that part of Tennessee, if you go to visit there that day, today, they're extremely proud of that heritage. They, they, they call themselves the state of Franklin. I think there are uh, Franklin towns in, in around there too, but you'll find businesses all over that say like the state of Franklin savings and loan or the state of Franklin bakery and deli, that kind of thing. They're, it's something they're very proud of. They, they once were a state called Franklin. Um, we also had a state, we. Kind, well, it was more of a territory. We finally did get a Jefferson territory. Um, Colorado, before we settled on this nice little rectangle, it had stretched quite a bit further north. It was a, also a rectangle, but it was quite a bit for, further north. And um, Colorado took over some of what was, had been Nebraska. These are mountains in this area. And believe it or not, when gold was found there, Nebraska said, we want nothing to do with it. Because they had seen what, elsewhere when gold was found, it brought in nothing but trouble. You know, the worst of the worst would come in to mine gold, and it was totally lawless. Nobody had law enforcement facilities to take care of that kind of thing, and it was a mountainous region, hard to, hard to take care of anyway. And t Nebraska said, no, we want nothing to do with it. Colorado said, we'll take it on. So um, that, that's how they ended up there. But for a while, they were even further north. By the time they settled on the border, again, trying, they brought down the border a little bit south again to kind of regulate that size of that state and change the name. It had been Jefferson at the time. They changed the name to Colorado when they solid, uh, uh, ratified the state. Colorado is a, a Spanish word for red and there are a lot of, there's a lot of red um, rocks and things there. So, um, so that was kind of interesting. So Jefferson did get his state kind of. It, never, it wasn't ratified as a state. Um, one of the interesting stories I stumbled on, um, the southern border of Pennsylvania right here, that was actually the very first thing we um, surveyed. By the way, you, are you going to give me a signal when I'm about up? Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, we hadn't surveyed, when we, when we were settling out here, nothing had been surveyed and there were battle wars all the time, border wars all the time. Everybody was claiming, you know, hey, I'm in the Virginia territory, no, you're not, you're, you're supposed to pay taxes to this one, and it was a total mess. And most of these people, they'd come from places in Europe where 
surveying was a commonplace thing, so it wasn't a stretch to say we've just got to start surveying. So they started with the southern border of Pennsylvania because at that time the capital was in Philadelphia. And the border that had been prescribed by the King of England from across the ocean cut right through the middle of Philadelphia. So it's like, like we can't have that. We gotta, we gotta redo this. So they called in two astronomers. So at that time, surveyors were astronomers. And just like mariners do with the, you know, the star charts and things, they're looking at the stars and figure out where they are. They did that on land too. And so two astronomers came over from Britain and um, they, had a team of like say 20 um, aides and then behind them they had a team of 100 axemen that would follow behind. So what they would do is they'd, they'd get to a place, they would um, look at their star charts, they would study the stars and figure out where they were in relation to the parallel line that they were supposed to be on. And when they, were, when they would locate themselves, they'd put a stone up and move on to the next one and behind them these axemen would come and cut down all the trees to demarcate the line. So this is you know, a huge undertaking. And in fact, just the southern border of Pennsylvania and also it happened to be the western border of Delaware took them four years. Because you can imagine they're going through woods, swamps, hills. Uh, they had horse, you know, pack horses and things like that. There'd be accidents. I mean, it was, it was a grueling thing. But it was an uh, astron astronomers who did that. These two astronomers were named Jeremiah Dixon and Charles Mason, and it was no became known as the Mason-Dixon line. And I don't know about you, but when I grew up going to school, I always understood that the Mason-Dixon line was some kind of like a, a hypothetical line that divided you know, the North and the South. And it wasn't, it was just the southern border of Pennsylvania, but it, it kind of, it, it did lend itself to it later on because when the Civil War broke out, it did kind of separate the North and the South. But it wasn't a literal line other than the fact that it was that southern border, so. Okay, yep, plenty of time for questions. What, what do you want to know that I might be able to answer? Yes, yeah, I want to know what Florida pulled to get all the coastline and shaft Alabama and Mississippi. Well, interesting, and it used to be different too. When um, Florida used to have a panhandle that went way over to here. So they used to, have, and it was a little higher too. So they totally got more than you even know today. And that was all owned by Spain. That was like Spanish, the Spanish, like their last stronghold. And, um, and you know, they weren't going to give it up. But at the time, Spain was also all over South America and Central America. So it, they, that, they did start to sell off things when they were going to focus south. So little by little, it was like in chunks. They sold off this piece that became that kind of boot um, toe of Louisiana. So that's the first thing they sold off. Then they sold off this little chunk that got then divided by that line into the two, you know, Mississippi, Alabama. And then that's when it stopped. So we, we did buy back some of that. But yeah, they still, they still end up with quite a big chunk of panhandle, so yeah. Um, some states refer to themselves as commonwealth. Is there any difference between a state and a commonwealth? That's a good question. No, like Virginia is a commonwealth, whatever. No, there, it doesn't mean anything different. It's just another name. They just kind of um, adapted you know, from the homeland you know, back on, on, the, um, on the continent. So it does mean exactly the same thing. I think there are three or four that still use the term commonwealth. And by the way, that reminds me, the state of Rhode Island isn't actually Rhode Island. Their actual name, and I always have to look at it because I never remember, the le legal name for Rhode Island is the state of Rhode Island and Providence Plantations. And that's legally how it is, is it because they combined two, two um, settlements kind of to form the state. And as recently as 2012, the citizens there were, um, it was at, on their um, voting that they were asked, do you want to keep the full name or do you want to reduce it just to Rhode Island? And they voted overwhelmingly to stay with the, the full name. So that was an interesting little thing. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's within that Northwest angle that you talked about. Isn't there a piece of property that is surrounded by Canada? Actually, yeah, most of it. The people who live in the Northwest angle up there, first of all, it's mostly water. And so there are islands and there's some resorts and there are some people who live there, but almost everything they do is in Canada. They, they must carry their passports on them at all times because if they go to the grocery store, it's in Canada. If they go to uh, Target or whatever, I mean, everything they do is in Canada. So uh, I think there's, I think, yeah, yeah Target. I think their uh, schooling is American schools, um, but just about everything else is through Canada. But, isn't they, but is the land surrounded by Canada? Basically, I mean, on three sides. Um, yeah, three sides of it is surrounded by Canada. 
And there's if you're on a boat up there, you can cross borders and not even know. Yeah, because yeah, you're just in the middle of the water. It's really important to have both fishing licenses. Yeah, that's what I understand. Yeah, and there's a, in the northern part of Vermont, there's an area like that too, where one town is almost like cut in half by a Canadian border. So, so one yep. more question. Our son lives in Maryland, and that's a really oddly shaped state. What can you tell us about that? Poor Maryland. They lost every every border battle they had because they were their northern border was supposed to be the one that cut through Philadelphia. They were granted they would have had a much thicker neck, you know, but. Um, Pennsylvania won out with that one, so that was their first battle they lost, and then. Um, on the um, okay, they have this little kind of um, I'm going to move over here. Um, a little thing that dips down over here. On the very tip of that is a little finger that's actually Virginia. It's another one they lost out. It's like a peninsula that sticks down, and Maryland assumed it was all theirs, and uh, Virginia settlers had already settled there, and they wrangled back and forth, and eventually the government granted that to Virginia. So yeah, poor Maryland. And then, of course, D.C. was carved out of it, too. So it is one of the craziest. If That's one of the states that you look at and you say, really, did they plan this? You know, like West Virginia, did they plan a state like that? So, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.